Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, so this is, um, I'll be talking about uh, relatively recent uh, work uh, with Vlad Vicol, who's also at Princeton, um, <coughs> on uh, non-uniqueness of weak solutions for Navier-Stokes. So I'll be considering uh, the following Navier-Stokes equation for any um, kinematic viscosity. Uh, on the left, on the right of course. <laughs> 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 Otherwise, it wouldn't work. <laughs> um, so, uh, kinematic viscosity, uh, any kinematic viscosity new, and the V will be our velocity vector, and we'll consider the incompressible Navier-Stokes equation. Sorry, on on periodic boundary conditions, yes, but that's not so important. Uh, so. We have to define what we mean by a weak solution to the Navier-Stokes equations because there's many notions of weak solutions. Okay, so uh, what I mean by a weak solution is that if the velocity field is in, uh, say, continuous in time, L2 in, in space, and it satisfies the Navier-Stokes equation in a distributional sense, then we'll call it a weak solution. Uh, for these types of solutions, uh, we actually have, because it's continuous in time, we actually have that it satisfies an, uh, an integral equation. Okay. Strong continuity. Uh, yes, yes. Strong. Strong. Yeah. Okay. And more. What does strong mean? Just continuous in time. Like, not, not a weak I mean, the continuity. Yeah. L2 norm goes to zero as S. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yes. The yeah. It would be continuous in the weak topology of L2. Not, not, no, L2, not the weak in the sense of integrating further against another function. Yeah. So based on um, the natural scalings of the Navier-Stokes equation, there's a you know litany of results, and I won't go through all the results, um, but in some of the results, so you have partial regularity results. Um, which were, you know, was started by Schaeffer, um, and then you have the famous, also the famous caffarelli con nuremberg result, which improves the previous work of Schaeffer, and then the later works of Lin, Ladrienchik, uh, Kaya, uh, Saragin, Vasseur, Kukovitsa. Um, and you also have local existence for... Uh, Those are upper bounds for the singular system. Yes. So different ones. So I mean, the different ones. So the 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 yeah in in the parabolic that if you do parabolic yeah. scaling, then it's it's one. Okay, that's that's sort of the Caffarelli con Nuremberg yeah. 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 result. Oh no no, they're not stronger. This one is the this one is the same. Uh, this one is box counting dimension. Oh okay. And uh, so I mean, there's so just different notions of yeah. Different proofs, yeah. Okay. So yeah, this Vasa is the same is the same result, different proof. Um, so and then we have local existence for the Cauchy problem um, in sca any in scaling invariant spaces. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about this Geospheric result later. Uh, we have conditional conditional regularity. That is, if you have some extra assumption, say on the Geometric structure, say in Constantine A, um, in uh, Constantine and Pfefferman, which they say that the you know the vorticity doesn't vary in direction uh, that much. Then, or you have that uh, say a sign pressure condition, you can also establish um, uniqueness. You also have can these other arguments like conditional regularity, weak strong uniqueness. You have all these Ladyanchka uh, Prodi Seren conditions. For our particular setting that we're considering, uh, you have that if the solution is continuous in time and L3 in space, then you have that you have uniqueness for this particular setting. Okay. 
<coughs> there's, so there's a different, you can also have the, you know, similar results, L infinity, L3, if you have Lirae Hopf, but for, we're not considering Lirae Hopf solutions. I'll talk about that later. But in our setting, if we just have L3 integrability and continuous in time, we get uniqueness. And you get uniqueness of the weak solution? Yes. And you get regularity. It's smooth. And you get and, and everything. And you get smooth. Everything, yeah. Sorry? Uh, so, ah, does, oh, does someone know? I mean, people know existence of the, of of, of these type of weak solutions that belong to these spaces. No, <laughs> no. Well, if you could show that, like, for any initial data that has yeah. this, yeah. Uh, <laughs> belongs in this, then yeah, you've solved yeah. the problem. Yeah. But. But, but, no. you just need a little bit of, yeah. but you don't, yeah, you don't generally, you, you can't generally even consider, you know, you can't generally also consider, uh, construct weak solutions in, the, in these sort of spaces as well. So the L2 is not sufficient, but the L3 is. The, the problem is the continuity, I think, yeah. Continuity, sorry. Yeah. So it's, it's normally in the, you consider a weaker topology where you replace this by L2. Then you have some other conditions, like you have a Lirae Hopf solution and stuff like that. Yeah, the, li the Lirae Hopf sol solutions are not strongly continuous. In no. That's why I was asking. Yeah. They are continuous only in the weak topology. No. So our result, uh, which is proven this year, was that we can say for any, uh, there exists some better, doesn't matter what it is really, um, uh, that for any smooth energy profile, we can construct a, a Navier-Stokes solution with that um, kinetic energy profile. So in particular, so if we have, say, an energy profile, well, maybe you're not meant to do that. <laughs> Is it? OK, it's heavy. OK, so if you, so you can have nightmare solutions, for example. What, what is a nightmare solution? So this is this idea. Idris Chichi came up with, I think, the idea of, oh, I mean, he didn't show this, but he, he came up with the name, um, where you have a solution which has zero energy and then has some energy and then it has zero energy. So this is in time and this is the... This is already fundamental with uh, zero and then something happening. Zero, something happening, and then zero. So why they're called nightmare is this idea that you have your glass of water that is completely still, you fall asleep, <laughs> and then you wake up in the middle of the night and it's oscillating like mad, and then you fall asleep again and it's completely still. So it's like a nightmare. So, uh, so this was the, so Sheffer was the one, when we were, I'll talk about the Euler equations soon, and in the case of Euler equations, the first proof constructed such solutions, these nightmare solutions. Sorry? Zero energy is perceived as V equals zero. V equals zero. So it's, I mean, you know, they're not physical, right? If you could do this, you'd you know, solve the energy crisis because you can create energy from nothing. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, but this is not the only solutions you can construct. So one thing that you'd like is that the energy is decreasing. You can also construct solutions with energy decreasing. So you could have a profile that goes like this, and you can construct a solution which has this energy profile. So again, this is just um, E of t, and this is the time. And what you could do is you could change it at a later stage, like this, and then you'd end up with say E1, this is E2. The solution here would be the same. Um, the solution here would change. So you can construct solutions uh, with strictly decaying energy profile, uh, which are non-unique, okay? Because they, they're the same initially, and then they, they change. Um, um, but both of the solutions have strictly decaying energy. Okay. Is this, is this beta is quite small, I suppose. Beta is like, so I think Vlad computed it in the paper and put it as a footnote, and it's like one, I don't 
10 to the power of 16. We didn't, it's actually not that small if you actually bothered to compute it. But we didn't, we didn't try to find out what the, we didn't, sorry? We, uh, so we didn't try to get the optimal better at all. So there's a trick which I'll talk about later, which uh, you, this trick means that you get a very terrible better. Um, but uh, you know, the optimal one would be one half, because at one half you get uh, regularity. So you expect that you can do this for all numbers up to one half, but we can only prove it for some small better. Yes, I would imagine. But you know, the, the re extra regularity you would impose would not give you more conditions on No. Conditions. No. Not for this, no, not for, not in this sort of class where you just make better going anywhere up to one half. You would imagine you get the same result. Does this suggest the fact that you have these non predictable weak solutions that they blow up for regular solutions? It gives you some strong indication that. Uh, if the kind of mechanisms like this happen uh, for in Navier-Stokes, and if you can prove that blow-up happens for Euler, it kind of shows you that the dissipation isn't that great. It doesn't. I mean, it doesn't stop so prevent blow-up. That's really the moral of the story. Anyway, right? the, yeah. So, so uh, I mean, I'll talk about the structure of these solutions, and I would expect that some of the properties of these solutions would happen. Uh, in a solution that blows up. And one thing that you'll see about the structure of these solutions is they're very particular. So you'd think that it would be very rare for such a uh, solution to actually, ha maybe, it's, maybe it's kind of rare that such a solution happens because to keep this structure, which I'll explain later, it would be very unstable. That's... Uh, some people's philosophy, it's but not it's not my philosophy. <laughs> my philosophy is both blows up. Physicists believe that. Some people think. But everyone, actually, people have every permutation. <laughs> So some people think that Navi it's even possible that Navier-Stokes could blow up and Euler uh, doesn't. <laughs> that sounds <laughs> very unlikely, but that's, there are some people that have suggested something like that. So what do I? Just, just in just so in my talk, everything will be just. Continuous in time and L2 in space. That's all. But, but the point is, you, I mean, you, you go beyond the L2 because you've got the. Oh, it gets, it's better than this. You get, the, you get, the, you get the beta. Sure. Small beta, but, but presumably the same thing. Sure. So we actually get a, yeah, a stronger result than that. Um, and then, as a corollary of this work, we have that uh, any, if you have any solution weak solution to Euler. So something that I'll talk about later is, you know, and Camillo is the resident extrovert in this room, uh, that uh, for, for Euler we have non-uniqueness. We have all sorts of things for non-uniqueness. And one question is, one question we often got in talks was, can any of these solutions to Euler be constructed as an inviscid limit of Navier-Stokes? Now, first of all, you have to define what you mean by an inviscid limit of Navier-Stokes. If you take the weakest possible notion of, of the, an inviscid limit, that is that a sequence of weak solutions to Navier-Stokes converging to a weak solution to Euler, then you can, you can construct all these solutions that we had before as a weak limit, as a, as a strong limit of weak solutions to Navier-Stokes. Yeah. Well studied now. Can be obtained as as inviscid limits or viscosity going to zero limits of Navier Stokes. Of weak solutions to Navier Stokes. Weak solutions to Navier Stokes. Yes. Okay. 
And this is actually a very yeah, that, 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 yeah. this is actually not very hard to prove once you have you have the other. Have the other yeah. So that brings us back to what was the other results. So uh, so the famous conjecture, which is now resolved, of Lars on Saga in forty nine was that any weak solution belonging to a holder space for regularity exponents greater than the third conserve kinetic energy. So I should point for smooth solutions, it's very easy to see that a solution to Euler equation conserve kinetic energy, we should just integrate by parts, um, use the divergence con condition, and you get uh, conservation kinetic energy. If you want to justify this statement, you can do this as long as the holder regularity is greater than the third. And below a third, there exists weak solutions which do not conserve kinetic energy. And so this was first considered by a Yink, who gave a, a, a partial result and then later proven by Constantine Ern Titi. And then there was later results um, by, say, Duchamp Robert and tested for Constantine Freeland and Svetko. Okay, so this was resolved a while ago. And then only last year, the second part was proven. And again, there's a long history of papers. So the first result was by Schaeffer, where they constructed light nightmare solutions. Then Schneerman showed that you can construct uh, L infinity in time solutions, but also he could construct solutions which uh, have strictly decaying energy profile. Um, and then Camillo and Laszlo um, sort of put this in a sort of uh, a, you know, a stronger framework, and they proved a bunch of results. They also improved it to L infinity, and they also showed uh, other results such so that it can satisfy like local energy inequality and all sorts of things. And they showed just how bad things can be. And then this was the first holder result was due to Camillo and Laszlo, where they proved C110, and that was two papers, and then the improved by Phil. And there was another paper by myself, Camillo Laszlo, and these two papers are now a joint paper. Um, and then, so I proved that you get the regularity if you consider just almost every time that you get the regularity. And this was improved in um, joint work with Camillo and Laszlo. And then Phil finally proved last year that for any better less than a third, there exists weak solutions to oil equations with compact support and time. And I should have on this slide also that this used a result of, um, of Laszlo and uh, Sara Denieri, um, where they constructed the building blocks that was used in this, in this proof. So it's, it's, C, it's, it's C one third in, in space? And time. And time. Yes. Um, and then. Uh, so we gave a shorter proof recently where we showed that you can also prescribe the energy profile. Well, uh, uh, and, and then, well, maybe we're going to say that next, but then if I work outside the, the, these, these holder classes and I work in the HS classes. Yes, that's the question. next slide. So one question is that can you go... Solution which is not <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, with yeah, compact support and time <laughs> and non zero, <laughs> non trivial. Yeah. And uh, so it was a good question is that we, for a long time we thought we couldn't get past the one third. We thought one third was like a critical regularity. And we thought this was, we had no reason, we, we kind of had heuristics because our arguments didn't work. And it's a common thing is when the argument doesn't work, then you think that it can't be proven. And so Phil proved this result. And we were working on a similar thing with uh, Vlad and Nader. But we had only uh, Sobolev regularity. So we had a result where Sobolev regularity was one third. And then we thought, oh, well, this paper came out. And we thought, well, that's not that useful because it's a worse result than this. So we thought we'd better improve it. Uh, <laughs> yes? But for large heat, you know that it can accumulate. There is a constant support of time or 
For yeah, greater, than a third. Greater, than, greater than a third, you have conservation. So uh, it's sharp, that's why it's in the, but that's for the oil. So the pipe is only for one third. Yeah, but now you're going to change the space. Isn't it? Now I'm going to change the space. <laughs> oh, yeah, not quite. So uh, if we go back to the classical theory of turbulence, so I should also, so wh what's the idea, of, general idea of general sort of picture you have in turbulence is that you have eddies at some scale, like this. And they break up into smaller eddies, like this. Which, um, in turn, break up into even smaller eddies, and so forth. And what happens is they pass the energy on from the large eddies to the small energy to the small eddies. And this is called the energy cascade. And this is the classical theory going back to G.R. Taylor and Richardson. And this was formalized by scaling arguments by Kolmogorov. And you can use the Kolmogorov argument or, the or Ansaga's argument to get the one third from scaling arguments, just using simple th arguments of this. The sim simple thing is that you have to assume that the time it takes for the energy to transfer to the next scale is roughly the time that it takes to turn over. And then you assume, in addition, that energy doesn't dissipate, doesn't vanish at the inviscid limit, and then you can get these scaling exponents, like one third. What also you get is you get something more, is if you write the structure functions, and this, the notation I have here is that just uh, delta so what do I say here? Uh, delta V uh, L is just V um, dot minus V dot L. And I mean, w when you, they always, you know, a lot of people will say they're for Navier-Stokes, but and no way in any of the proofs they use the viscosity other than the, the, the you know, at the limit, but uh, energy doesn't d dissipate. So it's not all that important that it's Navier-Stokes. It's important that you have the Euler part, but the other part's not so important. Uh, now, if you take these velocity uh, displacements and you're considering homogeneous hypertrophic turbulence, so you don't care about the directions, so you have some length scale, and here you're really, um, say, subtracting um, a vector with that length scale, but you don't care which way it's pointing. Then, by simple scaling arguments, you get Kolmogorov's uh, four-fifths law. Now, this is an ensemble average, like a statistical average. For us, we could also take a time-space average, and you'd get the same thing. And what's kind of surprising is for the third structure function, you get this law where this is the, um, the d energy density, so the, the energy dissipation density function, the amount of energy dissipated uh, in a unit mass. And this is the length scale. And what's surprising is that you actually get some constant out here. And this is actually confirmed by experiments. But um, yeah, so this is why this is called the four-fifths law. And you can also establish other laws for other moments. And you just generally get something like this. And if you just do the scaling argument, you get p on 3 for this exponent. Now it turns out. So, so this, is, this, this explains the 1 third, right? Yes. Yes, this right. explains what. The, 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 the scaling just, ex yeah. This. That, that's, that's why the third comes out. Exactly. You get this uh, velocity gradient of the Yeah. You've already actually made the assumptions that get to this, which, which imply the one-third, yes. So, yeah, of course. Right. But yeah. This, is, this, is, this, this law here, the, the S3 law. Uh, this would imply one-third, yes. Yeah, but that's supposed to be exact, right? I mean, well, it's not. No, no, the SP, no, but the S3. This one is meant to be exact. That's what I'm yeah. Because that's scaling. 
which is kind of funny with this four and five constant, but it's meant to be exact, yeah. And it's very, by experiments, they actually get four on five as this number. So, so this I'd, tells you about how, how the velocity varies at, at very short scale, right? Because yeah. Your L is very short. Yeah. This is all, all from very short scale. Sure, sure, sure. Now, what happens is that this picture um, actually breaks down. It, so this is the, so that was the classical theory, and the, that third law works, but but the other laws aren't quite correct, or uh, in what's measured in actual turbulence. Sorry, they're wrong. <laughs> they're almost right. With all the physical law, you should never say it's wrong, just because it can be useful in certain circumstances. <laughs> but it's almost correct, but but not right. So wrong. Uh, so Landau in 59 uh, observed that the rate of energy dissipation is intermittent. Now you can draw this picture with the energy in, uh, dissipation in, this could be a time slice, could it actually be a, a spatial slice, it doesn't matter, it will look the same. Okay? You, the important thing is that you see these large peaks occurring. Well, the peaks are, where the, are the times or positions where energy is, is lost. Yes. And so later you'll see a similar picture. This is experiments. Uh, both. I mean, this, this, okay, so this particular picture comes from Srinivasan, and he just had it on his, uh, on a slide, and I told him to send it to me. Oh, he, oh, he did, yeah, he did, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and but we're not sure if this is the same picture as uh, as some other picture in one of these papers. It's very hard to see if these peaks look the same. It's all a mess. You mean when they're statistically the same. And in the in the in the actual paper, he doesn't say what this actually is. He just says it could be either. <laughs> so he says it looks the same. So it doesn't really matter. So in particular, for the second structure function, which is, the, which is related to Kolmogorov's spectrum, you expect a correction. So this is K41 theory, and these are the exponents here, and the P here, and it's a straight line. And the result of a Zyger's conjecture, or the result that Phil proved, he constructs solutions that behave roughly like K41 theory. 1941 Kolmogorov? 1941. Yes. <laughs> K41 is Kolmogorov 1941. It's the paper. Um, but in that's, the linear one, right? line that's just a linear line. That's the one right off the third, right? Yeah. But what actually what they observed is, well, these are different models. No one, there's a big argument in the physics literature of what the correct model is, and no one can, uh, no one can agree. And maybe it depends. There is no uniform model, maybe. But what something they agree is that it goes above the K41 line at for P less than 3. It touches the line at P equals 3 and then goes below. It's got to be convex. So yes, it has to be convex, yeah. Um, so, so this leaves the question is, for example, uh, if you consider the, the spectrum, this is, this is larger than 2 on 3 which it should be. All these numbers are larger than two or three. So can you construct solutions which actually have regularity greater than one third, uh, greater than one third for when you reduce the integrability? And so this is what we have, has been in preparation for a year and a half. Um, and we have, a, we have to finish this paper, but uh, uh, what we showed is that you can yes you can go above one third. This number is above one third because five hundred. <laughs> I made a mistake on Camillo <laughs> explaining this to Camillo before. But I got different numbers the wrong way around. I got numbers less than a third, <laughs> which was a bit worrying. But this number is definitely greater than a third. But this is not sharp, okay? You can get energy conservation for 5.6. Maybe you can get all the way up to 5.6. I don't know. 
Um, but the only important thing is it's above one third. And to do this, we had to introduce a lot of new ideas that aren't in complex integration theory. So, I mean, there's some ideas uh, in the previous papers by myself and the paper joint work with uh, Laszlo and Camillo, where we got some gain from integrating in time. But this is, this is really, yeah, there's, yeah, there's, this is, this is really using the idea of intermittency in convex integration. And so I don't think this is, well, this hasn't been done before. So, we'll see. Can you say in a word how you're going to use? We need objects, we need building blocks, ah. which, building blocks which have, the, which have peaks that look like that picture. Constructing We're constructing them. So we want it to look like that picture we had before. So that's uh, no, it's not homogeneous in that sense. No. I can't keep it. No, no, no. So, okay. so how how does it work? So the basic idea is that you have a convex you have this uh, Navier Stokes uh, Reynolds system. And in this audience I'm allowed to call this the Reynolds stress. Uh, <laughs> in some audiences I'm not. Uh, anyway, so the so the how how you get how this sort of equation naturally arises is, say you take a solution to the Navier-Stokes equation and you average it at a length scale. Then you'll get a Reynolds error. And, so, and you should really think of it in, terms of, in these terms. So in this convex integration... So now you're going to explain how you get these. This sure. Is, this, is scheme, so, so this is just the general... This is the scheme for producing these weak solutions. Yes. Right. So we create a sequence of approximate solutions with an error. Um, which will converge to a real solution. And you should think of the approximate solutions to be roughly the final solution averaged at a given length scale. That's roughly what they are. It's not exactly, but roughly what they are. So, uh, so you have, it, it works by induction. So you have a solution to the, to, uh, at one stage Q, and you want to create a correction to the velocity field, which creates a new solution with smaller Reynolds error. And so you, you create the perturbation, which we'll call W. Uh, you design it in, or, in order, so you will get a new solution. And the idea is that, that you have a smaller Reynolds error. Then if you write this, yes? So why is this called convex integration? <laughs> So it had much more, so back in, back when, uh, so in Camillo's and Laszlo's earlier work, where they're really using more stuff, which is more in the line with Gromov, uh, you had, you had it, it really made sense because you had like the idea of a sub-solution and you took a convex hull and then you, you proved it. But the thing is, so I, this is how I, say it. I don't know. <laughs> you can tell me when they had the, the, the papers, the C, C0 and the uh, one, uh, one tenth result, they tried to model it more in the line of Nash, which is like the original paper uh, with a C1, uh, the C1 embedding yeah. thing. And so it wasn't called convex integration there. Convex integration came from Gromov. But this is more like the Nash. The Nash so it sh maybe it should be called Nash iteration, but we can't change that anymore. <laughs> so I don't know if that's fair. Do you agree with that? Well, yeah, it's kind of fair. Well, anyway, so, it's, so convexity is playing an assumption. So the basic, even, even here at this level, if, if you're averaging, that R circle yeah. will satisfy a basic inequality, which is telling you, for instance, what the energy could be. Right? So yeah. when you're constructing, for instance, with an energy profile, you know you can also, also only achieve a certain type of energy. And the inequality that you get is a Jensen's inequality on some convex function, actually. And that's the convex. So, so the convexity is there so that's why, that's even why at this level. I mean, no. of course. But it plays more, on, it's not a, it doesn't play as, so, as a I mean, even the key short, result. Uh, you start from a short embedding. Yeah. And the short embedding is just sure. a relaxation of uh, yeah. true embedding, mm -hmm. true isometric embedding. Yeah. And the shortness is, again, a Jensen's inequality, so convexity inequality. The complexity is there. Now. Okay. Yeah, that helps explain. No yeah. yeah. Now, a friend of mine actually said we call this convex integration because we could cite 
but almost in any sense better. But Citing Nash is also <laughs> is, is a good way to sell <laughs> things as well. This is a nasty remark for all of us. Okay, so if you if you have say a solution to this equation and you sub in the substitute in the equation that VQ solves, you get the, the an equation for the Reynolds stress. Um, and I'm splitting it into two lines. Uh, so one, this bottom line is dealt with in, uh, in much the same way that previous schemes worked. And the top line is dealt very differently. The most important things, of course, is this uh, viscosity term that wasn't there before. Okay, and I'll call this the linear term. This was called the quadratic term. And this is the oscillation term. Okay, so what we do and what was done in uh, what, what, what we're going to do is that the perturbation is going to be a superposition of what we call intermittent Beltrami waves, which are at some frequency lambda q, which grows uh, super exponentially. Okay, uh, so and it will really grow super exponentially. A and B is much greater than one. So in the more recent uh, papers. Uh, we have tried to make B very small in order to get, obtain good regularity. Since we're not interested in regularity, we t can take B very large, which is going to help, actually. Okay, and this, this was used in the earlier papers um, by Camillo and Lasso as well. So the perturbation will be of some form where we have some amplitude, which depends on the previous Reynolds stress, and these intermittent Beltrami waves. The amplitudes are designed such that the oscillation error is small, such that we get a cancellation in the low modes of this term here. Any of the remaining high modes will be swallowed into the pressure. Okay, so... And just from scaling, you see that the Reynolds stress, if you, if you say that the, uh, I should have done it the other way around, if, uh, if you assume that the perturbation is roughly lambda q to the minus beta, so minus beta is your, beta is your regularity exponent, then you get the Reynolds stress has to be uh, q plus 1 to the minus 2 beta. That's an order, it must scale like this for you, for you to have a hope that the oscillation error, which is this quadratic term, can cancel the low modes of the Reynolds stress error. But you haven't chosen the A's yet, right? I haven't chosen A's, but this is an algebraic thing, and this was in all the earlier work. Must reflect the viscosity. Uh, you, the A's have nothing to do. I'll, I'll explain where the viscosity comes in, but it's not to do with A. So if I... So in all the older schemes, the idea was that you have a set number of frequencies. So this is frequency space. And this is, say, the old scheme. Um, what you would have is that the, the conjugate frequencies would interact in order to, so this is, say, frequency lambda q. Uh, these are plane waves. Plane waves. Yeah, integer points on the sphere. So they're plane waves. Yeah, it will be the 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 vector will be pointing in a perpendicular direction. In fact, you'll be taking. So in the old method, what you did is that this you took Beltrami waves, which eigenfunctions of the co-operator. So you could imagine just like a uh, a vector which is oscillating, say, forward. And it's it's pointing like this and twirling around. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, but in frequency space, I mean, they have a you know vector, they have a vector associated with it. Um, but if you just look at the frequencies, what will happen is these high these two conjugate frequencies will interact and produce a low frequency, and then the amplitudes are chosen to cancel the Reynolds stress error. So the RQ lives inside here. 
Okay, so you choose, this will create a zero frequency, then by adding on the amplitude then you can correct this Reynolds stress error. That was the old sort of idea. Okay. How much time do I have? Uh, Okay, great. So, uh, so yeah, so, so this is a particular example of the Beltrami waves. So they're stationary solutions for Euler equation, uh, which is a simple calculation. You can show that um, if you take the divergence of V tensor V, you get a term, you get a gradient term. Okay. So we're going to model, we're going to change this. We're not going to use exactly Beltrami waves. We're going to use this new object called intermittent Beltrami waves. Now, this is the old scheme. Is this intermittency related to the intermittency you were talking about earlier? The, the yes. Or yes. Random? Although it'll be more regular because it's more constructed, but but it's related. So, how do you create intermittency as a well? If you take your first course in uh, analysis, you're aware of the Dirichlet kernel, which looks very much inter like an intermittent thing. It has spikes, OK? And so what you do, instead of this picture like this, um, you have a similar picture. That's in one variable. Sorry? That's one variable. That's one variable, but you can do this in three variables. So if you take a cube, say, of frequencies, like this, etc. Your frequencies are all simply on the integers because you're on the total system. Yes. Um, so you take a cube of frequencies. Now, I'll explain later, but this, this gap here has to be much larger than lambda q. I'll explain why. So again, this, this is roughly lambda q plus 1. Okay. And what happens is that the, the exact conjugate frequencies will interact to cancel. The ones that are not exactly conjugate will not interact they'll be put into the pressure. And this is also a great simplification in the case of Navier-Stokes, which you cannot do in the case of when you want uh, regular solutions. Like in, in the case of Nader, we're not going to do, we have to do something much more complicated with Nader and Vlad. But in this case, um, so this is what the picture should look like. And you expect to have them very peaky. And what this means is that the L2 norm is much is, is if you normalize the L2 norm to be 1, then the L1 norm will be very small, roughly the square root of the number of frequencies. Okay? And you can get rid of the log by replacing a Dirichlet kernel by a Fayet kernel, or whatever, regularization of it. That's not important to this. Uh, so if, uh, so each, so each, uh, each Beltrami wave will be made up of lambda q plus 1 divided by lambda q frequencies to the power of some p. Now, why is it lambda q plus 1 divided by lambda q? It's divided by lambda q because the gap between the frequency has to be greater than lambda q, which I haven't explained yet why that's the case. But you need this. Okay? And the lambda q plus 1 comes from the fact that you have, that the, comes from the radius. Okay, so you roughly expect there to be lambda q plus 1 divided by lambda q to the power of 3 number of frequencies. You have to take something less than that, but you can, you can take something arbitrary less than 3. Okay? Uh, and you, you need to take something more than 2, which I'll explain briefly. And this is, partly, this is the reason why this argument does not work in two dimensions. In two dimensions, you don't have enough space in frequency space in order, you don't have enough oscillations in order to cancel it, which is good because <laughs> Navier-Stokes is, not, you can't have such a result for Navier-Stokes in 2D. Okay. <laughs> so, 
So why does this help? So if you consider the, the dissipation term, we can write this in divergence form, and this is the part that will be put into the pressure, into the Reynolds stress error. And you hope that this is small. Why is this small? So we're, we're treating the linear part as an error. Okay? And this is, makes sense because in the idea of turbulence or non-uniqueness, you expect that the non-linear term to dominate, not the linear term. Okay? So you put it in a regime that's the non-linear term dominates the linear term, and the linear term is an error. So, this, so you take this term, and you want to estimate how big this is. You estimate, you have to remember that the, the perturbation is measured in L2, the Reynolds stress is measured in L1, just from scaling. So that you measure this in L1, and what you get is that this is roughly W11. So there's one derivative, and you measure this in LP. The one derivative costs lambda Q plus 1, because you're at frequency lambda q plus 1. But then you get a gain of, so, so oh, I, I didn't mention that you can make this lambda q plus 1 divided by lambda q to the p, roughly lambda q plus 1 to the p prime for any p prime less than p, by making sure that the frequencies grow quick enough. So this is where we're using the super, yeah, so use the this is where we use the double exponential growth. It's much harder to do, and this is why we did this short. We, we had planned to do this the other way, uh, where we couldn't do this, but it's, it's very hard to do that. And this is why this paper uh, came out before the paper with Nader, Vlad, and um, myself. So what we do is we get this gain of minus p prime on 2. And here, you see that this is small so long as p prime is greater than 2. And this is where we have the restriction here. And this is why this does not work in two dimensions. So we also need, not that the Reynolds stress error goes, is not just that the Reynolds stress is small, we need that the perturbation will converge in L2. A naive estimate, was we, we just estimate this in L2. We put this, say, in L infinity. We put this in L2 because this has lots of frequencies. And then we just get, because this is normalized in L2, we just get an estimate of the sum of all the amplitudes. But this is terrible, because this scales like the L infinity norm of RQ to the half, which we don't have control over. We only have control of the L1 norm. So we can't do this, naive estimate. And so what we do is we use a little lemma which is that if you have a frequency which is supported, I uh, have a function which is supported in a frequency, uh, in frequency radius lambda, and you have a, a function g, which is one on sigma periodic, uh, for where sigma is much larger than lambda, uh, then you have that the LP norm of fg uh, is, uh, is, can be estimated by the LP norm of f times the LP norm of g. Okay, which is, you know, of course this does not work in general. So, the, so this allows you uh, to get a much better estimate because now you don't have to put this in L infinity, you can put this in L2 as well. And this is correct because this has the right scaling and you get convergence. So this is a nice little trick. I've, I've, this is, I think I'll set as an exercise in, if I teach analysis. Uh, I never, I, I, does anyone know this, that's seen this little trick? It must be somewhere as an exercise and so. Yeah, it ha but the, that's, and this is exactly why the gap has to be bigger than lambda q. Because the frequency of the, of the perturbation is of lambda q, so the gap has to be bigger than lambda q. Yeah, I mean, I, I must be, yeah. Anyway, it's, it's a simple exercise to prove, so it will definitely be a homework exercise or something later. You still have to explain the viscosity. I did. I didn't get it. <laughs> <laughs> the viscosity is small because you measure, so compared to all the other terms. Put anything there. I mean, uh, what are you using by the viscosity? Okay, what am I using is that if I look at all the other terms, 
mean, that's the... All the other terms are quadratic. Right. And we're measuring this in L1. These... That's the, it's linear, okay? okay so you get a gain from the L, L1, LP. Yeah. Yeah. So here you have to do L2, L2, but here you can do L1. All these terms, are like, all these terms here are small. Okay, the time derivative is tiny. This is also linear. This is something very different than in some other schemes. In fact, you get very... Uh, very good regularity in time for these yeah, solutions. Yeah. So, so what the intermittency does is it means that it makes, it puts the whole solution in the nonlinear regime where the nonlinear term dominates the linear term. That's the idea. So, how that, so, so then can you explain how that helps? Uh, it means that you can, so, So, I mean, the point is that in all the convex integration schemes uh, Are you before. That now the proof proceeds like in the Euler case? Sort of. Uh, sort of, yeah, more or less. So, like in the previous schemes, you get like, you get some small error and then you get some high oscillatory term um, and you get a gain from inverting the divergence and things like that. Now, if you try to do everything in C infinity, uh, C, C0, what you would have a problem with is that there's two derivatives here as opposed to one derivative here. So doing this in L infinity, you have no hope of closing such a, and which is good because if it was, uh, if it was C0, then you'd have uniqueness for Navier-Stokes. Um, but if you measure it in, if, if this is measured in L1, which corresponds to w being, v being measured in L2, then this can be smaller. This can be smaller than the other terms. So this is the critical idea. And then, and then you need this like little lemma to show convergence. And okay, so future directions is that we would love to prove non-uniqueness of Livre Hopf. That would be the hope that this would be like a grand goal. Um, so So, so what would? So, so this is one setting. So one setting is that you could say that there's different ways. And say you take some uh, something, some function which is continuous in time. You don't need this, but uh, an L L two in space, then L two in time, and H one uh, in space. This is just so that this makes sense. Inequality makes sense. Um, and then it satisfies this inequality. That's a Lee Ray solution. So this is only with the initial time. Uh, this is the this is only with the initial time. There's other versions where you. The version is when you also take in later time. Exactly. There's so other versions. This solution in principle does not have to be. Uh, in any in any region of time. This solution still has to be smooth. No, the the Lee Ray result is assuming that you have inequality also for every, I mean you have to substitute zero with almost every later time t. Is that true? Yeah, because he's, at least the way he proves it, he's showing you that if you are h1, you have a smooth solution, mm -hmm. and then he's using the weak strong uniqueness. Mm -hmm. But to use the weak strong uniqueness for that small amount of time that the classical solution exists, you need the energy inequality from that time. Okay. As far as I understand it too. So I think if you only assume that, I Okay, that's how I have to check, yeah. Yeah, that's, that, okay, so at least the proof that I know is using substantially that you have uh, not only the not just the time, but yeah. you have also the starting time that you mm -hmm. can change. Because it's using the weak strong uniqueness even later on when yeah. you have the classical solution. So now if there is another way of proving it, that I don't know. But the only way I know is using um, something different from this. Okay. Well, that, still, yeah. Still, anyway. Non-uniqueness even under that assumption would yeah. be very surprising. Yeah. This is the weakest version of the, and this would be, this is still very hard. <laughs> Don't one expect non-unique solutions to this equation? 
uh, one we, we expect. How much trust you should put on us is another question. <laughs> but it's so these would be solutions in which you would seek some dissipation, right? You would only you, 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 have, to have, you have to have dissipation. It's enforced, yeah. Ah, yes. So, so uh, Gia and Sverak, uh, how Gia and uh, Vladimir Sverak uh, presented a possibility of constructing non uniqueness of Li Ray Hoff solutions if some spectral assumption can hold. They have to they have some linear operator and they have some um, assumption about the eigenvalues of this operator. Th they have numerical evidence to show that it can be satisfied. So, this is a recent work with. Quilo and uh, Sverak, they've had numerical evidence of this. I mean, so I remember Vladimir presenting this in 2013, and he said that it would be done <laughs> in six, <laughs> in a, it, it, was, it was a really easy <laughs> thing, and it should be done. And we thought, this is great, um, but we're still waiting on a proof. But it, it seems reasonable that it's true. It's just, it, it turns out that checking this spectral assumption is, is really hard. It's, so what is this? Well, we'll ask you later. Yeah. Um, and so we, we conjecture that there's non-uniqueness for Li Ray Hopf and that it can be proved by some version of convex integration, which is probably much more complicated than the one I presented now. And it has to be, because uh, it has to take into account uh, intermittency and time as well, because you can't have this in L infinity H1 because then you would have uniqueness. So our solutions are very regular in time and they can't be. They have to be not smooth. And so, um, a, res so a recent result by Camillo, uh, Colombo, um, and De, Le uh, De Rosa uh, was that they can construct. Uh, Li Ray Hopf solutions if you have a weaker, like a fractional Laplacian. But this is for S one fifth, so this is, so there's quite a long way to go from one fifth to one. So there's some, yeah. Yeah, you can actually do one over three. I mean. Oh, one of, okay. Yeah, well, not in that paper, but, but uh, the Rosa is actually working out one over three. Okay, so it can go to one on three. But, but that's kind of less surprising because yeah. it's below the Onsager threshold anyway. So Sure. It's it's more in the framework of the yeah. the of the re, of the previous work on on Saga. It, it doesn't use intermittency. Right. Yeah. They actually have the energy inequality for every time. For every time, yeah. So, questions. <laughs> Thank you. Sure.